Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder. And since I completed both the Battle of Chickamauga and the Battles for Chattanooga, I thought I would animate the lead-up to those fights with the Tullahoma Campaign, as well as connect it with the Battle of Stones River in the future. If you'd like to help support the channel, please share the videos, join the Patreon page, or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. I greatly appreciate all the support. Thank you. For the first six months of the year 1863, Union Major General William S. Rosecrans' Army of the Cumberland sat idle at Murfreesboro, Tennessee, unmoved after the Battle of Stones River, which took place between December 31st of 1862 and January 2nd of 1863. Opposing him, and also sitting fairly unmoved, was Confederate General Braxton Bragg and his Army of Tennessee. For the other major Union and Confederate armies, 1863 was a year of movement. Union Major General Ulysses S. Grant and the Army of the Tennessee maneuvered down the Mississippi River and by June was laying siege to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia landed a decisive blow against the Army of the Potomac under Joseph Hooker at Chancellorsville in May and by June was invading Pennsylvania with the Army of the Potomac given chase. The Lincoln administration wanted movement from Rosecrans. The Union General argued that he was doing valuable service by holding Bragg in place while the other Union armies moved. Plus, by staying put, it kept Bragg from sending reinforcements to other locations. However, that was completely false. Bragg's army had dwindled while staying at Tullahoma, Tennessee. He sent cavalry and infantry to reinforce commanders in Mississippi. Meanwhile, Rosecrans's army was growing, totaling about 80,000 men. His cavalry force had basically doubled, allowing him to screen and advance and to gather information on where the Confederate forces were located. Bragg had fewer than 50,000 men. Bragg and Rosecrans occupied locations between Murfreesboro, Tennessee and Tullahoma, Tennessee. Bragg's strong-mounted arm under Nathan Bedford Forrest and Joseph Wheeler guarded the roads over which the Army of the Cumberland would have to march if that army went on the offensive. Joseph Wheeler, commander of the majority of Bragg's cavalry, got intelligence that the Union Army was on the move in mid-June. Wheeler removed Martin's cavalry from the right flank of Bragg's line and sent it to the west, to Spring Hill to meet up with Forrest, where they would make a mad dash upon Rosecrans' supply depot in the Union rear. However, this only weakened Bragg's flank and would deprive him of needed intelligence if the Union army moved. Rosecrans planned to swing around the Confederate army to the east and cut Bragg's army off from its depot at Tullahoma, trapping the Army of Tennessee north of the Elk River, where it could be destroyed. On June 23rd, Rosecrans' plan went forward. First, Mitchell's cavalry pushed south toward Farmington and Shelbyville, but they encountered heavy resistance along that line, as Wheeler's cavalry remained strong in that area. Granger's reserve corps, right behind Mitchell, traveled northeast to Salem, along with Mitchell, who could not push past the Confederates in that sector. As Granger's corps moved, the rest of the Army of the Cumberland advanced along their planned routes. Thomas Crittenden's 21st Corps was on the far eastern prong. George Thomas's 14th Corps advanced toward Hoover's Gap, Alexander McCook's 20th Corps moved toward Liberty Gap, and Granger's Reserve Corps made up the far western prong of the advance. Liberty Gap and Hoover's Gap were occupied by cavalry, with Liberty Gap reinforced by troops from Patrick Claiborne's division. Hoover's Gap was manned by cavalry and troops from Alexander P. Stewart's division. Richard Johnson's division was tasked with pushing through Liberty Gap. August Willock's brigade led the division through Liberty Gap and came into contact with St. John Liddell's brigade of Confederates from Arkansas. Sounds of skirmishing rang out from Liberty Gap, and Johnson sent John Miller's brigade to Willock's support, placing the new brigade on the right. The defensive positions of the Arkansans allowed them to hold on despite being outnumbered, but with their flanks becoming overlapped, they withdrew. Johnson sent Philemon Baldwin's brigade in pursuit of the rebels as they moved through the gap. Baldwin's brigade engaged with the 5th Arkansas and easily pushed them back. Liddell's brigade took up a position on the heights surrounding the road. William P. Carlin's brigade also made it to the field to take the place of units who may be running low on ammunition. The next day on June 25th, the battle continued for Liberty Gap. The four Union brigades formed up and began engaging with the Confederate skirmishers. Liddell requested support from his division commander Patrick Claiborne, and Claiborne dispatched Sam Wood's brigade, but it would be a while before reinforcements could get to Liddell. The lone rebel brigade commander brought up two more regiments to make a stand in the hope that reinforcements 
would arrive in time to throw back the Union attackers. The Union brigades attacked in the afternoon. Liddell's men doggedly held out for as long as they could, but it was no use against such overwhelming numbers. Liddell, without the reinforcements he needed, pulled back. Wood's brigade joined him soon after, and Claiborne began to form a strong defensive line to throw back another Union attack. As the fight for Liberty Gap was taking place to the east, George Thomas's 14th Corps was moving toward Hoover's Gap. With John T. Wilder's brigade of mounted infantry, armed with Spencer repeat and carbines in the lead. Wilder pushed back the light cavalry resistance at the opening of Hoover's Gap and saw that the fortifications about midway of the gap were empty. Taking advantage of the situation, Wilder pushed on to the south end of the gap. Just beyond laid the brigade of William Bate. The Confederate regiments attacked Wilder's men, but the firepower from the Yankee weaponry held the gray troops at bay. Bate reinforced the wings of his battle line with the 9th Alabama Battalion and the 15th and 37th Consolidated Tennessee Regiment. Wilder, likewise, took as reserve the 17th Indiana and part of the 98th Illinois and extended his right flank. The Midwesterners held their ground. The rains all day slowed down any Confederate reinforcements, but by Sunday, Bushrod Johnson's brigade made it to the field. The next day, heavy skirmishing took place at Hoover's Gap, but no major attack was launched. During the fight, Wilder was ordered to withdraw by his division commander, but he refused, believing he could hold the ground. Also, holding the ground would make the advance of the rest of the Corps much easier. When George Thomas's Corps commander and the Army commander William S. Rosecrans made it to the Gap, Wilder was prepared to apologize for disobeying orders, but both men told him that he saved thousands of lives with his actions. Without his cavalry to the east, Bragg didn't know that Rosecrans was trying to move around his flank. The heavy fight at Liberty Gap made Bragg think that the main thrust was coming from that direction, so he wanted Leonidas Polk, one of his corps commanders, to push north and attack the Union force at Liberty Gap from the rear, while Hardy attacked the force at Hoover's Gap from the south and east. Polk wasn't able to move out before Bragg called off the attack. Word that Hoover's Gap was captured led the army commander to order a complete withdrawal of his forces toward Tullahoma. The rains and the arduous job of climbing into the Cumberland Plateau made the marching horrible for both the Union and the Confederate armies. Rosecrans was attempting to get his forces to Manchester and then cut off Bragg's retreat and trap him north of the Elk River, but the delays due to the weather allowed Polk and Hardy's Corps to get to Tullahoma. In Shelbyville, the cavalry screening the movements of Polk got defeated by Union horsemen. Bragg began to prepare for an engagement to Tullahoma. He asked his two corps commanders what he should do. Polk said to retreat to Chattanooga, and Hardy was inclined to wait and see what the Union were going to do next. Meanwhile, Rosecrans's forces concentrated at Manchester. Wilder's brigade of mounted infantry made a dash upon Bragg's right flank at Deckard, destroying Confederate supplies and any infrastructure to slow down Bragg's troops. He then pressed on to the University of the South that was started by Leonidas Polk. This raid by Wilder scared Bragg, making him think that the Federals were already on his flank, so he finally ordered his men to fall back toward Chattanooga. Although he didn't trap Bragg's army, Rosecrans's Tullahoma campaign was an impressive feat. Within a few days, with little fighting and simply outmaneuvering his Confederate opponent, Rosecrans and the Army of the Cumberland brought Middle Tennessee under Union control and drove the Army of Tennessee to Chattanooga. Combine the successful Tullahoma campaign with the major Union victory at Gettysburg and the surrender of a large Confederate garrison at Vicksburg, June and July 1863 was a major turning point for the Union and its war effort.